Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Charlie. I'm an alcoholic. And um, I'd like to welcome you all to the closing days of our annual membership drive. <laughs> um, I want to thank the committee and Perry specifically for inviting me to be here and uh, Mark for picking me up at the airport yesterday and getting us lost, which was uh, interesting. Uh, he says he has, he's a fireman. He says he has a bad sense of direction. I kind of worry about that. You know, uh, so if things are fine and Mark's out hosing off your house some morning, uh, you'll know he just got the wrong address. So he's, uh, Anyway, um, well, um, it's good to see all my friends here. I see the people. I, I haven't seen Ed for a while. Ed's come to our group for, uh, recently, but I hadn't seen him for a long time before that and enjoyed hearing you last night. And Cindy, and I'm looking forward to the other speakers. And... Um, and I'm just, uh, I'm sort of the rookie in the middle of this. <laughs> I have the least amount of time of almost anybody here. And uh, uh, I'm sober since the 11th of June of 1981. And I haven't had any need to tamper with that at all. Um, I'm an alcoholic. I have no outside issues. That's pretty much um, the extent of them. Um, and I still don't like people as much as I did the last time I was in Chicago. Um, I um, are we toddling yet? I uh, I'm not a toddling kind of guy. I um, I've never liked people. I've always been uh, uneasy where two or more are gathered. I've um, I was an only child. My mother had four pregnancies and three of them were, were had died at birth and I was the only one that survived and I knew I knew that she and my father were a little bit disappointed in the <laughs> issue of their loins and I uh, was always uh, you know I was a sickly kid I got out of school a lot uh, fortunately I was a good speller so I got through school okay and it was to help me with with women later on but I uh, <laughs> was really not uh, very, I was just a, a wheezing, asthmatic little boy uh, who just would prefer to be alone. Thanks a lot. And, and uh, I have a problem that I think a lot of alcoholics experience. That is, I, I detest the human race, but I demand its approval at the same time, which gives you a, it gives your life torque, certainly. And I, uh, I uh, have always been on, you know, that in that sense that, oh, man, that, you understand. I don't know who I'm talking to. Um, you just can't share this at staff meetings at work. <laughs> they don't even know where I am this weekend. I left early yesterday. I didn't go in yesterday. And uh, I told my boss that I was going to a function in, in Chicago. And she said, really, you're visiting friends? And I said, yeah. yeah. That's the way I'm putting it. And she said, uh, where are you staying? I said, I don't know. And, um, <laughs> and she said, are, are you driving in from the airport? I said, I don't know. <laughs> well, who's getting you? A guy in Chicago. Uh, <laughs> you really start trying to back out of the questions at that point and, and uh, without lying. But AA speakers are superfluous anyway, really. Anybody who's ever spoken in an AA meeting will tell you that we're the least important people in the room. <laughs> uh, the coffee maker is the most important person in the room. <laughs> AA speakers are merely the... We are merely the penicillin monitors in the, in the syphilis ward of life, really. Uh, we don't have any power outside of AA. and we, we just are here because people ask us and we're flattered. And uh, I don't take this terribly seriously, but I don't take my... I take my sobriety terribly seriously, but not this. And I will wander around, and I didn't get paid for this, so you probably figure that out by now. And... Uh, um, <laughs> Anyway, where was I? I was a child, and uh, and I always remember feeling completely like Ed described last night. There was no, you know, 
there was really no reason for my feeling the dis-ease that I felt with people or things. And I was always angry, and I was always disappointed, I guess, in life. Just disappointed. Because I would read books. I'd read Tale of Two Cities and read how people would go to the gallows for a friend. And then I look in my neighborhood, and there's nobody going to go to the gallows for anybody in there. Uh, nobody's going to sacrifice their life. But everybody talks about humility and these virtues that everybody's supposed to have. But I'm not going to do that alone. I'm not a sucker. I can see that other people don't do that. And I'm not going to do it by myself. But I want to do that. And I want to believe that other people do that. But they don't. So I just suck it in and make nice. And they'll all approve of me and give me pats on the head. And then I can allow the anger to leak out in other areas. You know. And I walked around with that. And at, unfortunately, anger tends not to leak out as quickly as it builds up. And I was uh, pretty irritated by the time I was in school, especially with the pointed comments about my inability to make things happen. Like, I'm talking about potential, which alcoholics are prone to have. It's sort of a tertiary disease. It's um, Don G. talks about being crucified on the cross of potential, and I certainly felt that. Uh, I've been dragged into some of the finest offices around uh, teachers, priests, counselors, everybody to have with my parents in tow and have them sit down. Now, my dad had a, like a fourth grade education, fifth grade education. My mom got through the seventh grade, and they were very disappointed when they heard the teacher say or the counselor say, you know, Charles, looking at, they always have the folders. You know, they've always got your folder. They're going through it, and they get that look on their face, not the kind of look where they go. It was always... It's always the same look that everybody gave you, uh, that look like, what are you thinking? Um, <laughs> but I, they would always say the same thing, and that was, you know, Charles has lots of potential. We just don't understand why he's not doing anything with it. <laughs> and my parents would look at me, you know, and my response to that was always the same. You know, I know I've got potential, thanks. You know I've got potential. They now know I have potential, thanks again. I'll use my potential, though, when I'm goddamn good and ready to use it. <laughs> Not a moment before. When I do use it, I hope you're wearing sunglasses, Scooter, because I'm going to light you up. <laughs> but until then, I would suggest you take your idiotic concern for my potential and go wipe it on somebody else, because if you were such hot shit, you wouldn't be a high school counselor, now would you? <laughs> It never came out in exactly those words. Uh, I usually said something like, I'll try harder. Uh, but I always felt the same way inside, and it's exactly what Ed was describing, and our stories are completely different, but it's the same disease. The guy I related to, when I was newly sober, I was about, I guess, maybe five or six months sober, and you can take one look at me and know that my strong-arm robbery days are ahead of me. And... Um, I was at a meeting, and I, I was still kind of in that fog that you have when you're four months sober uh, that extends into your 20 years uh, eventually. But I, I was sitting at a meeting, and I heard Don N. talk about, and he, this guy spent 20 years in Folsom Prison, you know, for a lot of, I'll let him tell his own story, but uh, certainly not in there for just, you know, kiting checks. Uh, Don was in there for some pretty bad stuff. And the more he talked about himself and the way he felt in his life, I completely related to this man. I mean completely. And my story was nothing like his. And I felt my entire insides open up when I heard this guy talk because that's exactly what I experienced. And, and the thing that helped me the most was to hear that the same thing happened to him at some point that happened to me when I was 18. And that was when I got out of high school with no notoriety at all. Um, I wound up... Uh, going to a party, which was an unusual thing for me because, as I understood it, there were people at the party. And uh, I'd never been to a party till I was 18 years old. I did not like parties. I knew people drank at parties. I felt like they were weak. They are. Um, I felt that, you know, I just didn't like it. just didn't like it. I, it was one more thing I could judge. It was one more thing that wasn't like me, because I am, not, I am not like them, I'm not like my parents, I'm not like anybody. It seemed to me there were two types of people in the world. There was everybody else in the world and me. 
which is a lonely promontory upon which to view things. And I also had what a lot of alcoholics have, and that is the big picture. I don't know if you've ever been struck with the big picture all of a sudden, but it's a horrifying thing, and, it, and it, it's a mixture of elation and great frustration at the same time, because you get the answer to the problems in the world all of a sudden by looking at the wrongs other people do, and yet you're powerless to change them, so you do like I do, and you don't do anything. And you sit there, and you ache, because you want something to happen. You want something to change. I would like to affect change myself, but I can't even take... I couldn't even take my uh, my SAT tests in, in high school. I just didn't have the wherewithal to even take them. They weren't mandatory at the time. You didn't have to take them. And you had to take them, but you didn't have to take them all at once, and I just never took them. I didn't understand how things worked, and I didn't want to investigate it. And I didn't want to be a party to all that. And it was, you know, here it was in the 60s. I'd never taken a drug. I'd never had a drink before. And I went to this party, and I was one big percolating knot of, of percolating testosterone, really. But because uh, that, they say, Ed said last night that, you know, your God is whatever you think about the most. <laughs> so <laughs> well, we need go no further than that. But I, um, I uh, went to this party, and, and there they were. You know, them. And you know who they are. They're, cause they're them and they're all doing their little thing being, being people, which is, it's, it's, it's a curious thing. I would look at them like I'd look at lab rats. Isn't that cute? You know, that one's standing up on its hind legs, you know, and, uh, uh, just watch them scurry around trying to mate and trying to eat and just f- satisfy their disgusting base urges. And there I am with the big picture. <laughs> trying to hold it, you know, um, and someone came up to me halfway through the party, and, and I'd gone there with a friend of mine from high school, and, and he drove, so I couldn't leave, and it was in the middle of nowhere, and there's a big Victorian house in Santa Ana, and um, somebody walked up and just said, here, uh, you want a drink, and they gave me a can of malt liquor, one of those big, you know, those like 84 ounce ones, they're, they're this big around, but they go all the way to the floor, you know, that kind of thing, and uh I stood there looking at this thing and holding it and holding it and holding it and the condensation dripping down. I thought, uh, you know, I'm not going to drink this because I'm not like these people. <sighs> but I'm, I'm thirsty, you know. So I took a drink and I took another drink. I took about, I drank about half that can of malt liquor. And something curious happened. I realized all of a sudden that I'd been way too harsh on you people. <laughs> um... I started to feel kind of fond of you. I don't know why. Um, The big picture could just sit off to one side for a while because I'm sort of grooving on what's happening in this room. At the bottom of that can of malt liquor, I was in full Irish flight. I was... uh, the poetry was coming out of me. I was, I was uh, uh, just this tender mixture of, of, of William Powell and David Niven and Errol Flynn with a, with a healthy dose of John Lennon stuck in there, which is really hard to pull off when you look like Sherman from the Mr. Peabody cartoons. But um, I, was, I was giving it a go. And I was, I was filling out my skin and my soul as I was standing there. I, that's the only way I can describe it. I didn't care about the way I felt before I got there. I just felt absolute, utter relief on a can of malt liquor. Relief from from 18 years of stuff. All of a sudden, a half a can of malt liquor, and I'm feeling complete relief inside my soul and feeling happy and joyous and free, which is what alcohol does for alcoholics. And I didn't know at the time that it doesn't work that way for 95% of the population. I thought it must work that way for everybody. That's why everybody gets this. That's why everybody drinks alcohol. That's why it's legal. That's why there's a liquor store in every corner, because it makes you feel like a human being is supposed to feel and not this brittle dick that you are before you start drinking. It just, you know, oh, God, I feel... I need another can of malt liquor, and um, I, 
uh, needless to say, I, I drank quite a bit that night and wound up uh, running alongside of my friend's car as he was leaving. I didn't want to go, you know, and he's pulling away. I got a hold of the door handle. I was coming out of a blackout, and I remember throwing up on myself and just laughing my ass off because I'd been to the mountaintop. You know, uh, it wasn't going to get any better than this. It was, I felt alive for the first time. And I think the cheat of alcoholism to me is that you can feel that way. You can feel alive for the first time. And you never forget that. If you're an alcoholic, you have never forgotten that because that's why most of us don't, most alcoholics don't stay sober. Not because AA doesn't work, but because alcoholism is a considerable problem for alcoholics and anyone who's ever anyone who's ever ridden in an elevator with us knows that we are problem people you know and I've never forgotten that night I've forgotten a lot of the other stuff I've forgotten the grief I've forgotten the sadness I've forgotten the consequences but I've never forgotten the relief and I think that's why most alcoholics will go out eventually if they don't have something that they can use to replace that sense of relief and find a true spiritual center. Because for some weird reason, alcohol gives me, at least for a fleeting moment, a spiritual center. At least a, an illusory one. One that doesn't really exist, but it is to me. It does to me. I used to teach a, a high school for, for years when I was sober. And... Um, and we used to have to do an alcohol awareness week, which was always a joy. I hated it because the only kids who were really interested in alcohol and drug awareness were the ones who had no problem with it. Because the ones who had a problem with it, it wasn't about them. They didn't listen because it was out, drugs and alcohol worked for them. It's not a problem. You know, so the point... I didn't know what the point was. It was during the Just Say No era, which is really, <laughs> there you go. Uh, an ounce of this will make you feel like a human being for the first time in your life. Oh, I don't think so. Thank you. Uh, I think I'll just sit over here and suffer in silence. Uh, <laughs> jelly beans, anyone? Uh, I was, um, but that, that's how it happened. I, I, was, I was in an AA at my home group one night. This is probably 10 years, 15 years ago, and I was sitting there, and they asked for the hands of the new people in the room, and People were raising their hands, and I'm looking around, and, and, the, and the two women in front of me raised their hands, and they start looking around with their hands up, and, and they turned around, and it was two of my students from high school, and they both looked at me with this sense of shock and horror, and you could just see the wheels turning, and then they had this look that said, if you don't tell anybody, we won't tell anybody. And I'm gonna, How you doing, girls? They go, hi, Mr. Carney. You know, and they turn back around. I'd see them in the hallway, and we'd go by and go, you know, no comment. It was great. Because we're everywhere. We are everywhere. People have infiltrated uh, the society. We, we are part of them now, you know. We're not really one of them because we still have the salute. But we, uh... uh <laughs> We walk amongst them, and, and they don't even know, unless you're a celebrity and you tell everybody. But uh, uh, anybody within earshot of People magazine uh, will, will, never mind, that's an outside issue. But, and that's my opinion. Um, gee, I just lost my train of thought, but that's nothing new. Uh, I, drank for, I drank the same way for 12 years. My story is completely boring the most boring story in Alcoholics Anonymous. You'll hear much better stories. Uh, you heard one last night. You'll hear one. You'll hear others this afternoon. Even the Alanons have better stories than I do, and they didn't even drink. Uh, at least they were around to record the details. Uh, but I have never come out of a blackout yelling, you know, cut the red wire. Uh, I've heard some of you. I've never, I, I'm not a cop fighter. I'm, I'm, I'm really polite to police, and they would let me go. They'd pull me over for drunk driving, and I was really nice. And those were the days where if you could get by, it was really nice. In the mid-early 70s, people would just cops would pull you over where you're headed. And I lived in Santa Monica, which at the time was a relatively small community at the time. And everybody knew everybody else. And I worked at Santa Monica College because I wanted to be a writer, and I'd gotten into publishing. I was working at the receiving dock of their bookstore. And um, <laughs> so uh, I would, I'd be driving to the marina to go, go find her, capital H, her, and and be drunk as I've ever been and, and see the red lights, you know, the red and blue lights in the rearview mirror and thought, oh, no, I'd pull the car over, perk up, 
you know. Hi, officer, was I going too quickly? Uh, I, was, I just wanted to head home and be with my children. Um, <laughs> and and uh, they would come up and they'd say, they'd say, do you have any ID? And I'd give them my, my driver's license and I'd give them my Santa Monica College ID because every cop in Santa Monica went through Santa Monica College. Oh, you work at the college? Yeah. Oh, do you know so-and-so? Yeah, I know him pretty well. Listen, you just get home, all right? Just, and they would let me off the hook. You know, I should have swung at him, but, you know, uh, like I said, I, <laughs> my ass-kicking days are ahead of me, too. But I, um, uh, that's the thing is, you know, some of us, some of us acted it out and some of us just sucked it in and moved on. You're the ones who did time. Uh, others of us just sat around in quiet rage, wishing we could do time. But I, um, I have a boring, I, I used to come out of blackouts, never, uh, I never came out of blackouts saying much of anything. I used to come out of blackouts with people saying stuff to me like, you know, boy, I bet that hurt. Uh, um, I'm a, I'm a faller. I'm a, I'm gravity's enemy when I'm drinking. I, um, I know that the fastest way down a long flight of stairs is to just relax, you know. <laughs> Everything will turn out all right. Um, but I, um, I drank and I, I disconnected my relationships with people. I disconnected my relationships with my friends. I disconnected completely my relationship with my family, except when I needed money. My mother was there for a, a mother loan, which are non-repayable. And uh, no, if you'd have to, no interest. But um, that's how I perceived it. You know, my mother was like was pre-ATM an ATM machine. And I go over and go, Mom, I'm in real trouble. You know, I can't make my rent. And I, you know, da, 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 da. Well, and she would reluctantly say, well, how much do you need? And I'd say, well, if you could just give me four or $500, that'd be a big, huge help. And my mom would, you know, and, and my mom was, she grew up in the Depression, and it was just a hardship for her to write the check out and give it to me. And I'd say, you know, I'll pay you back. I'll take care of it. And I never did. And that, was, that wasn't one or two times. That was a lot. And I was just a, one of those pathetic guys. I married someone, listening to Cindy last night, I mean, geez, I, I married someone thinking that that would make me whole. That if I got married, I would become automatically more responsible, more focused, and more in the moment, you know. Because when I drank, what alcohol provided me, and I tell this whenever I talk, is it didn't get me drunk, according to my estimation. It got me there. I don't want to be drunk. I never drank to get drunk. I drank to get there. There is the place where alcoholics want to be. Every alcoholic in this room knows where there is, and you will never forget that. And if you're brand new, and you think that I don't know where there is because I haven't had a drink for a while, no, 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 no. We never forget that place. We all know where, we all know what is at stake for each other, because we all understand that place that we would like to be when the heat is on and the pain is tightening like a vice inside your guts. And we want that place that we can go to where nothing is going to hurt us. And that's, that's what I drank for, is that place of complete and utter relief. I just, you know, whether you're in a prison cell or you're living in an apartment in Santa Monica, when you go there, I mean, there are people dying within three blocks of this place right now. There are people who are never going to come in and have the joy of tasting AA coffee of talking, well, no, I mean, we laugh, but my God, I'll tell you something. Nothing tastes better when you're hurting than to come in and get a cup of AA coffee and sit down with somebody and say, I'm having a tough time today. And they go, I got it. I understand. Why don't you come with me? Hang out with me. You know, people have done that for me. You'll hear speakers tell you about that because that's what alcoholics do for each other who are sober. No one ever called me from the humdinger to find out where I was after I got sober. <laughs> they never said, you know, Charlie, I haven't seen you for a while. What's going on? You okay? Um... <laughs> ever, ever, ever. No one ever did. My buddy John, that I, um, I'm kind of getting far, uh, too far ahead of myself, but I got sober, on, as I said, on the 11th of June of 1981. I was in the middle of a divorce. Uh, I had married this woman who was non alcoholic. Um, she did not have uh, an Al Anon program, and she suffered with my behavior. And, and I'm pretty good at relationships up to the point where another person's involved and then it just all starts to unravel but I got good perspective on relationships because I got the big picture you know I know I can give I can give you direction on yours but boy don't come near mine uh because I'm like typhoid Charlie uh with that stuff but I 
I was married to this woman, and she got tired of dragging me into the bedroom by the arm from the from the living room floor or wherever I had gone to sleep. You know, she got tired of having to go pick me up at at the uh, banquet at a restaurant or at a, at a place like this. I was I remember going to a place like this for uh, the National Association of College Stores. I was the buyer for Santa Monica College, and they had a big thing at this hotel by the airport. And I went there, and I got so drunk in the evening that at the banquet I passed out at the table. And the people I worked with had to call my wife and say, can you come get him? You know, and, and she came and got me, and I was you know, making up excuses for what was happening. We had to go back and get the car the next day. And it was, again, you know, typical kind of alcoholic behavior, but she had had enough. And she uh, did what wives do when they're not getting attention from their husbands. And, it was, and then I got to feel like a victim. That's the joy of being an alcoholic in that. Because when all the stuff comes down, I get to feel like I was victimized. You know, we can turn anything into a victimization. I love victims. And we're in a society that just, we just feed victims around here. Um, but I got to be a victim. I remember my parents, uh, this is, here's another illustration of, of alcoholic thinking, I think. And that is that my parents asked me one time, my parents, my dad was a carpenter at McDonnell Douglas for 25 years, and my mom was a housewife, and they didn't have a lot of resources, but we always had a house and a place, you know, clean clothes and food and stuff, but uh, it was never enough for me. It was never the right clothing. You know, everybody else had Levi's. I was wearing the Lee Riders, and um, I always felt awkward and, and out of place and not part of, like, you know, the white trash complex, you know, except not exactly like that, but my parents said, what? trying to cheer me up one time because I always looked like the assassin, the potential assassin in family pictures, you know, and uh, we'd have a big group photo at our reunions and there I'd be in the back just kind of glowering. <laughs> um, it's always, I look at them now and it's like the one that they will call out if I ever assassinate somebody. Uh, they'll, they'll show that picture with the highlight on that part of the picture, you know. Um, so my parents said... Uh, so, um, if you could play a musical instrument, what would you like to play? And I said, piano, because I knew the likelihood of playing, of getting a piano at that house. I could have just said, I want to be a Mercury 7 astronaut. I would have been, it would have been that likely that they would have brought, brought a Mercury 7 capsule into the house. So I said, a piano, you know, <laughs> try to trick me. And uh, I'm not a trombone or trumpet or clarinet or recorder kind of guy. I want a piano. How's that? And, I, and they didn't say anything after that. Well, about six months later, I came home right before Christmas time. I was about maybe 11 years old, 12 years old. And there was a brand new Kohler and Campbell piano in the living room with a big bow on it. My parents had gone into hock to buy this piano for me. And I looked at that piano, and my first reaction was, what are you thinking? I didn't say I wanted to learn how to play the piano. I said I just wanted to play the piano. <laughs> don't you get it? I don't want to sit down and play lightly row and do finger exercises and that crap. I want to sit down at the piano, pop my knuckles, throw the key cover back, and play the piano to the point where women in the room begin to perspire <laughs> with fondness, and the men in the room get irritable from jealousy while I play the piano. Then when I'm halfway through the song, I'll just stop, close the key cover, throw my jacket over my shoulder, saunter over to the bar, get a double, and wait until the best-looking dame in the place comes slithering through the crowd, gets right up next to me, grabs me by the back of the pants and the lapel, and says, I want you now. <laughs> and, uh, and I would say, no. <laughs> because, you know, chicks dig the tension, I guess. Uh, I never found out, but I, I'm assuming. I've heard. Anyway, um... Uh, But I didn't want that piano. But you know, three about a year after I'd gotten it, you know, I cleaned the I cleaned the piano, polished it. Sort of a metaphor for my whole life was poli I've been polishing my piano for years. But I uh, <laughs> um, I polished the piano and played with the you know the seat had a little you could open it up and put stuff in it. That was cool. And uh, 
but I never played the piano. And then about a year and a half later, they sold the piano. I came home one day and it was gone, and they sold it just when I was about <laughs> to learn to play the piano. They have no faith in me. That's the problem. They don't believe in me. That's what I read it as. We can turn anything into victimization. I can. And I carry that around. My parents don't believe in me. My teachers don't believe in me. Nobody believes in me. I guess I'll just have to suffer by myself. And someday I'll write it all down and they'll go, Oh my God, if I'd only known, I would have slept with him. But, um, so I, that's how I felt. And I went to therapy, you know, my, my ex, my first ex-wife, I'm numbering them now, but, um, uh, my first ex-wife, uh, got me to go to therapy and I was in therapy for two years. It wasn't going very well. I was still waking up peeing blood. Um, I was still yellow-eyed. I was still, well, beige-eyed. I wasn't quite yellow-eyed. It wasn't, it wasn't that dramatic of a thing. Uh, I was just a mess. And, and we were, then we decided to get a divorce. And I, I went to a meditation retreat when we were in the middle of this divorce thing. It was, and it was a therapist who was holding this meditation retreat, which is, yeah, you're laughing. Yeah, you, meditation retreats are great for people who meditate. Um, <laughs> for a practicing alcoholic, um, it can be a little nerve jangling. I, um, it's hard to be around people who speak in really well modulated voices. When you feel like someone's piercing you with with stick, you know, hot sticks, and I um, I went there. I'd been drunk the night before. I've been trying to impress a bunch of teenagers at a McDonald's that I was a college professor. And the one kid got up, and I remember he walked by me and he looked at me and said, "You're just a drunk." And he, they all laughed and walked out. And I, got, I was just felt like a piece of crap again, you know. And um, so I went to this meditation retreat the next day, and uh, uh, I thought they might have some sacramental wine or something there. No, just tea. They had tea. They didn't have coffee. They had tea. (laughs) Herb tea. There wasn't a stimulant within 30 miles of this place, you know? And you couldn't just sneak out because you had to park like eight miles down the road and then go back up to the meditation place. And I was, I thought, you you know, my first reaction was, I said, well, we have some tea if you're interested. And I said, well, where, do you have any any wine or anything? They said, we don't have any wine up here. And I thought, Good Christ, you don't have any wine up here? You know, because I was coming off this night before, and and I was restless, irritable, and discontented at that point. And, and they had the next morning, you know, the next a- that afternoon, they had a, uh, a, a guided meditation. And I'm in the middle of that thing and thought, I'm just going to blow my brains out. That'd be a lot easier <laughs> than this, because she would play this soft music, and, and we would lie on the floor, you know, all of our heads together on the floor like a big pinwheel. And uh, she would say, and she was, uh, this is not, let me tell you something. This, this therapist was a wonderful woman, a wonderful human being, and a very competent therapist. The problem therapy has, and Scott will talk about this too, uh, is that it doesn't work on alcoholism. It works on every other thing, but it doesn't work for alcoholism. You can go to therapy as a sober alcoholic and have it work. But it doesn't, you don't go to therapy for your alcoholism. It doesn't seem to work that way because it's, a prerequisite for therapy working is the truth. <laughs> and you and I know how to paint the truth. I mean, we put a couple of coats on that condemned house for a long time. And, uh, and I'm, I'm laying on that floor, and I'm vi- she's saying, now we're walking through a field, and you can feel the grass between your toes. And it's sunny, and the sun is in your face, and the wind's blowing. Now, other people may have been thinking about the field, but I am shaken on this rug. I can feel that shag carpet coming right through my shirt, you know, like like wires underneath me. And I'm thinking, what is this field shit, you know? But I'm but I'm, I'm sighing just like everybody else. And um and I, she said, now we get to a waterfall, and you step into the waterfall, and you wash yourself in the water. And the water wash the red the water turns blue and it washes away your sadness. The water turns green and it washes away your jealousy. The water turns red and it washes away your anger. You know, we're going through the entire 
fuller paint catalog uh, <laughs> with this water washing away all this stuff, and I am not buying it for a minute. I mean, it's like, come on, I can't. Okay, waterfall, 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 waterfall. And then she said something. She said, I want you to look through the waterfall and you can see yourself and how your life is going to be in five years from now. And for a moment, I looked through that damn waterfall and what I saw was myself hanging from my belt from the back of, back of the door of my bathroom at home. That's what I saw. It was myself hanging by the neck uh, from my either my bathrobe, some something hanging, and I thought that is the answer. That's the answer I'm looking for. That's the only way to make this crap stop. Is that? And it wasn't a dramatic revelation. I think most people, when they think about suicide, I mean, I, I was at a doctor about a, about a year and a half ago, and my own physician said because I was going through something, I'll talk about it in a second, but he, he said, uh, have you ever thought about killing yourself? And I thought, well, duh. I mean, <laughs> somebody, you know, makes a bad lane change in front of me. I just said, it's suicide. <laughs> you know, I don't know about him. I, I, I see everything as being the nugget for a, an exponential... You remember the $6 million man where he'd look at something and then go, would go... You know, and it would grow. That's how people who make bad lane changes affect me. It's like zip, they're in there, and I look at them, and especially if they've got any kind of identifying mark on their car, like one of those little fish. Oh yeah, the entire the entire Christian world is a bunch of pricks. Uh, that's what I see. I I don't. I don't say anything. I just motion for him to go ahead and go ahead. <laughs> I was with Mark yesterday. Some guy cut, some guy in a big truck cut us off. Mark's laying on the horn, and then we're driving along. I thought, that he was pretty cool about that, you know. And I didn't say anything, and he didn't say anything. And he goes, you know, if you weren't in the car, I would have chased that guy. <laughs> <laughs> My first instinct was to say, let's go get him, you know. <laughs> And then I realized I'd be leaping out of the car, a 54-year-old man, right, to face down some guy in a pickup truck. But uh, anyway, uh, but that's what I saw. So I went out after that retreat. She said, I want you to go out on the retreat grounds, and for the next five hours, the next five hours, I want you to wander around the retreat. And it was a beautiful retreat place in Montecito, California. And uh, wander around the grounds and think about your life. <coughs> I have an alternative idea. <laughs> Why don't I put my face right down by the grill of your car and you floor it? Because uh, this is not going to work for me. And I, I went out there, out on the meditation grounds, and I felt exactly, I was still filled with that image that I'd seen in that meditation. And I walked around there for a couple of hours, and I thought, I want to hang myself, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it today. And I want to make this pain stop. And I sat down, and I thought, how do I do it? And I couldn't figure out how to do it. With a yeah, you laugh. Um, I didn't have a belt, or I had my out of my belt, but I couldn't figure out how to make the belt go around the tree to do. And I sat there and thought for a moment, this is completely hopeless, as my life is hopeless, and I want to die, and I can't die, and I don't know what's wrong with me, and I don't know what's happening. I sat there and started sobbing, and and it occurred to me inside. I got this feeling that felt like a voice, but it wasn't a voice, obviously, but it said, uh, you're everything that you're afraid of, and I still love you. You are everything that you're afraid of, and I still love you. And I felt filled with love for about 30 seconds. I mean, just absolutely full of somebody else's love. Certainly didn't come from me, or it felt it was in me, but it didn't. I don't know where it came from, and I sat there. I know where it came from now, but I sat there and just really felt confused at that point, and just sat. I sat and cried for about an hour. I didn't know what was happening to me. I thought I was going insane. And I went home from that retreat, and that was the 11th of June of 1981. And I haven't had a drink since. Uh, not that I haven't needed one, but um, I went home from that retreat and I was in a daze. I didn't know what to do. I, I was shocked. Now, 
new people might be confused about that kind of experience because most of us, a lot of us don't have that kind of experience at getting sober. A lot of us uh, have, we have these fleeting moments of spiritual awakening, like or fleeting moments of spiritual awareness, not awakening because that comes later, but those moments where your spirit gets tagged, you're it, you know. Sometimes it comes through the courts. Sometimes it comes through a family member who sits down with you and says, I can't stay with you anymore because of your drinking. Sometimes it comes when you're alone and you feel absolute despair and you can't do what you want to do, which is to die, uh, as Ed talked about last night. I mean, death is a relief for alcoholics. It's living that way that's, that's painful. It's living. The prospect of living for another 25 years with that pain was more than I could bear. And I knew I would live. I wouldn't just die. If I could just take three drinks and go toes up on the ground, that would be great, you know. But that's not going to happen. I'll just keep rallying. That's my problem. And um, so I taught, when I was teaching high school, I taught an essay on how to do things, how to. And one of the essays I used as a model essay was by a, a, an author who talked about how, it was a very short essay, maybe three paragraphs, about how to, how to open an oyster. An experienced fisherman teaches how to open an oyster because they can pull themselves, they can hold themselves shut, really. I mean, you can't pry those suckers apart. And, and yet, an experienced fisherman can take a knife and run it along the edge where they hold themselves together because at some point, the oyster has to get air and they'll open a little pinhole to breathe. And the experienced fisherman can put the point of the knife into that thing that's called the purchase point and slide it in with no effort and open that oyster wide open without any resistance because it stopped, it, it stopped and gave a little purchase point for it to get in. I think that's what happens to every alcoholic spirit, that at some point we stop fighting. We stop, not of our own will, not because we go, okay, I stop fighting. It's just, it's usually enforced on us or forced upon us. And we give up for a second. And the God who I believe is inside of us anyway makes his presence known. Here I am. I've been waiting for you. If you want me, I'm still here. And then we catch a whiff of that and slam that purchase point, you know, and he's gone. He's not gone, but my receptor's shut off because I can't deal with that. That's way more than I'm used to dealing with. My belief in God was that God is a thundering, you know, this big hairy Viking (laughs) who smites people that don't live up in the penthouse with him and his fine, good people, you know. All the people who keep their gloves in the glove compartment are with God. I, um, and that's who lives with God, not people like me. People like me are down in the basement of this building, in the dark, looking for the light switch. How are we ever, even if I stop drinking and clean up my act, how am I ever going to get up the 19 flights of stairs to the penthouse to be with God, who is perfect and who invites all the perfect people to come with him? You know, and, and Vinoy S., I mentioned that to her one time, and she taught me a lesson with that. And she said that, did you ever think that God would come all the way down into the basement to get people like you and, and, and herself? God comes down in the basement and gets us. He doesn't sit up and wait for us to come to him. He waits till we give up because he can't work with us if, if we don't give up. But we have to give up our sickness. We have to give that up, even if it's just for a second of, of confusion where he can make his presence known. Because I don't believe in a God who lives up there anymore. I don't believe in a God who lives elsewhere. I, don't, I love hearing, you know, you're, I'm not even going to judge it. People have, all have their own concepts of God. But whenever somebody goes, I want to talk to my God, you know, I, I immediately wonder, where is he? If, Because if he's up there, what's happening down here is chaos down here. We have no control. If we're waiting for him to intercede from up there. But I believe that God is inside of every single person. And yet, you and I can't see the God inside of us. We can only see it inside of somebody else. I'm not privy to the God. He makes his his appearance uh, or his his residency known by the way I feel sometimes. and, And allows me to do things that I could not have done on my own in my old life. But he brings that, he brings the, the ability to do that through his own power, not through my power. But I have to do it with somebody else. And I came, when I came home from that 
that retreat, I, I sat around for four days detoxing, just shaking it out. And, and my sister-in-law named Debbie called me, and she, uh, she said, would you, uh, would you take me to an AA meeting? She just got out of, a, out of a detox in Orange County, and she needed to get to an AA meeting. And I said, yeah, I'll take you. So I picked her up that Sunday. By all rights, Debbie should have been driving because I was hearing voices in the back seat. But you can't tell them, you know. Did you hear that? You can't say that to people. You're worse canny enough to know that. But I was driving my Volkswagen, which looked like me. It looked like somebody had slapped a smile off its face. It had these cockeyed headlights. Uh, it, was a, it was a messy... Maria remembers that car, that old beat-up thing. And, um, and I... I had it for 21 years, and it started to take on my characteristics. Uh, for a long time, it didn't have a reverse, you know, which is hard. You have to you have to park it on a hill, and uh, and you have to park it where people aren't in front of you. Have to you start compensating for all of the breakdowns in your life. I did anyway. We start compensating for things and making room for the the things that that are just odd, like like no reverse. And every area of my life was like this weird architecture of, of accommodation for the way I am so that I can protect the right to be the way I am and to drink to try to relieve that. Now, I, I, have a, I had a friend across the street from me, a neighbor named Tom, who was not an alcoholic. Tom was just a good guy, great neighbor, one of these guys who'd fix anything for you. He, he was a set builder, and um, he and his wife live across the street, and, and they had two toddlers, and Tom was in his 40s, and... And last year he got sick and uh, he started to have stomach problems and he went into the doctor and, and it turned out he had pancreatic cancer. And the doctor uh, said that they could do surgery on him. So I went over to see his wife one day and, and asked her how Tom was doing, you know, because he was in the hospital. And I said, how did the surgery go? And she said, well, the surgery went as expected. And I said, well, did they get the cancer? And she said, well, they weren't in to get the cancer. They were in to move things around and take things out so that the tumor has a place to grow so that he's not in such excruciating pain and he might live another couple of months so he can be with the kids for the holidays. But he's not going to make it. He's got six months. And so they just took things out, took good organs out and took good things out and moved it around so that the tumor could grow. And I thought, you know, and I'm not, I'm not trying to trivialize this man's death and his disease by comparing it, but I think alcoholics, alcoholic, the disease of alcoholism does the same thing inside of us and that is that we move everything around to try to accommodate the disease so it can grow. We shove everybody out of our lives. We slap people back. We push away help. We defy everything to try to have that right to sit there and just try to find that moment when, when I was there. You know, when I was there and it was all going to be all right. And I couldn't find it anymore. I mean, I could find it momentarily, but not for any period of time. And Debbie was picking me, and I picked Debbie up that night and 22 days sober in the car. It was a 20 minute, 25 minute trip to this meeting, and she 12 stepped me in the car. And, um, the woman who, who saved my life had 22 days of sobriety. So if you're one of these chumps that thinks that you can't talk to anybody because, well, I'm only in my first 30 days, think again. That woman, if had it not been for her 12-stepping me, I would not have made it. I wouldn't be here. And she, she gave it her best shot. She actually, I was pulling up to the curb and said, get out, I'll come in late, I'll come get you in an hour and a half. And she convinced me to come into the meeting. You know, and, oh, God, I did not want to be in that meeting. Ew, 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 ew. I still had potential. I had, a, um, I, I had great sympathy for you who didn't have it, but I had it, you know, and, and yet I stayed. And, and I got irritated when people would come up, you know, I'm in the back of the room with a deer stock. What happened all of a sudden? We start channeling Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> all of a sudden, 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 sudden. Um, uh, <laughs> Dick, Dick slumped over asleep at the. At the <laughs> uh, so, you know, people would come up and say, "Are you new?" And I'm in the back of the room, deer stalker hat, sunglasses, tweed jacket. I was in my writer's costume, uh, shoulder length hair, batting away the imaginary gnats that get in your peripheral vision sometimes when you're when you're drying out and. Uh, and I get irritated when people would walk up and go, Hi, are you new? I would go, No, I'm not new. I got four days without a drink. I haven't had a drink for four whole days, so I'm hardly what you'd call new. And they laugh like you did, which made me more irritated. You know, to me, new is drunk when you cross the threshold of the meeting. That's new. I got four days and I haven't had a drink. 
That was the hardest four damn days of my entire life. So I would appreciate it if you would wipe that little smirk off your face about me being new. I'm doing the best I can. Thanks. And I went out for coffee with her and her and all of her all of her fellow graduates from this care unit, you know, and they're all yakking in numbers. You doing two, I'm doing four, you doing four and five, I gotta do six and seven and just <laughs> sitting there at the at the coffee, you know, four of these people have got nothing to do, you know, and um, <laughs> You know, you get the, the twitches and the, and, the un, and then the uncontrolled crying. I drive to work and a seagull would go by the car and I have to pull over. <laughs> I get to work and my boss would go, you're a little late. I go, pull over. I, I couldn't tell him that. I just know. And I got a late start. <laughs> I had to pull over and cry. And, um, and I was a mess. I was a mess. You know? And uh, I, got a, I, I kept coming back to that group because, you know, it was exactly what Ed talked about last night. People were good to me there. There was a guy named Doc at that meeting. He was 10 years sober. He's an older guy. And he said he went to a meeting and, and he drove out to a meeting. He drove like 60 miles. And he said there was one guy there. And... Uh, so, and, and so he, had, he and that guy talked. I said, wow, you must have been disappointed. He goes, no, it was great. It's just me and this guy. And I said, you drove 60 miles to talk to one guy? And he said, yeah. It was really, it was perfect. It was just what I needed. Wow. Well, you're a far simpler man than I am. <laughs> I want to go home, open the door, and break the tape and have a, a stand of people cheering as I come home. You know, I got, I got to another day. And um, so I stayed in AA. I got a sponsor eventually, not, not out of virtue, but just to shut the rest of you up. And, um, and he gave me some directions. He asked me if I was willing to do anything to stay sober, and I said yes. Foolish, foolish, foolish. <laughs> listen to the words. Listen to the words. Don't agree to anything until you've parsed them out. Uh, are you willing to do anything to stay sober, Charlie? Yeah. I said, great, that's great. I want you to shave that mustache off, that silly mustache, and I'll see you at the men's day. Maybe get a trim on that hair, too. I'll see you at the men's day on Friday. Whoa, whoa. I'm, I'm a 30-year-old man. Uh, I don't think I need any grooming tips from a milkman. Uh, where does it say that you have to shave? And he says, it doesn't say it anywhere. So well, where is it in your big book? And, uh, <laughs> nobody, uh, nobody would ever just call it by its title. Uh, it's just got a big book. And uh, uh, how big a book are we talking about? Big book? Because I work in a bookstore on loading books. I know big from little. Uh, but, uh, and I wasn't impressed with the. Jay Walker analogy, but I, because um, I had a journalism degree at that point, and um, which which I had in a drawer someplace. But I, uh, I, I start. I said, "Where is it in the book?" He says, "Not in the book. It has nothing to do with Alcoholics Anonymous, really." He says, "I just, you just said 30 seconds ago you're willing to do anything to stay sober, right?" I said, well, "Yeah." He said, "I just asked you to shave your mustache off, right?" And I said, "Yeah." And he said, "Now, if you're not willing to shave your mustache off just because I asked you to do it." What makes me think you're going to do the steps when I ask you to do those? Because they're a whole lot harder than shaving, sport. He said, I just want to find out pretty quickly if you're a loser or not. I guess I'll find out Friday. And he got up and walked out. I can't even tell you how angry I was. How I can't even... Because, I mean, I was... By that time, I was about, about 45 days sober. And I felt like I can't go back. I'm... I'm stuck. I can't go back to that group again because if I don't shave and I have to hear it and explain it, you know, I just, I can't do it. So I sweated him a day. You know, I didn't shave for a day because I knew it would just irritate him. I don't know how because I didn't see him that day. But I, uh... <laughs> And then uh, the next day was Friday and I was going to see him at the stag that night and I got, went in the bathroom that morning and just the same way that I felt about that purchase point, the same feeling I got inside... Uh, said, if you fight one more thing, you're not going to make it. 
if you fight one more thing, it's not going to happen. So I took a shaver and I reluctantly, not believing a thing, not believing anything about this, I shaved that mustache off. I had, that was my only connection to David Niven. <laughs> shaved it off. And I went to the men's stag that night, and Bill saw me from across the room, and he came charging like a like a wild bull. And he got his arm around my shoulder. He's about six foot six, and he put his arm around my shoulder and said, "Here we go, sport." You know, and he's been my sponsor ever since. And uh, he's walked me through the steps, not sitting down, and we've never sat down and done the formalities of the steps, except for the fourth and fifth. We've done. He, he just said pretty much. This is where I'm stepping. Walk in my footsteps. He was at every meeting. He went out for coffee with everybody. He did everything that people asked him to do. And I had to do the same thing. And at about six months sober, I wasn't feeling anything. I wasn't having a surrender. I wasn't feeling any spiritual awakening. I was just being, I was just a sucker for AA. Because I was making, I wasn't making coffee. I was washing coffee pots. I was the literature mule Wednesday night. I got to carry literature in. I couldn't sell it because I didn't have enough sobriety. I could just carry it in for the guy with the bad back. And he would sell it. And then he would dismiss me. When I bring it, I'd, put, I'd bring the box in. Here you go. And he'd go, oh, that's great. I'll see you. Come back right after the meeting. Right after the Lord's Prayer. Come back here and pack it up. You know? And I, I did that. I did all this stuff. I'm mopping floors, you know, because I'm Irish. We're built for that. And, um, and doing all this stuff and, and, and I'm not getting anything out of it. And I'm not doing the steps. I'm not working the steps. Because I heard people they're working the steps. Working them. Work, work, work. You know? <laughs> I'm, I thought I was doing them but working them. Working them. Spot me. I'm going to do three. Okay. Uh, I thought you had to get some cross training clothes or something. You know, to do the steps. So, I started, I, I went to him and I said, I don't know what's happening. I called him one day. It was an emergency. He pulled, he drove to my place of work and picked me up and went for a drive and said, what's the matter? And I said, I just don't feel like I'm doing this right. I'm not doing the steps. He said, what are you talking about? And I said, I, I just don't feel like I'm doing the steps. And he goes, which steps? And I said, we might try the first three. Everybody else is doing them. Surrendering to God. I hear every meeting I go to, I hear a woman particularly get up to the podium and say, and I haven't done anything for three months and I, I did something today and all of a sudden I had, I had a big surrender. <laughs> and I thought, that's exactly what I want. I want the big surrendergasm. You know? Uh, I don't want these itsy bitsy little bitty steppy steppy things happening. I want to know. I want to get it right upside. Boom, you're surrendered. Yeah, baby. I, you know, I want to... I want one of those knock me down who's your daddy surrenders. I want a, some little puppy dog mince by time. So Bill said, okay, you're calling me every day, right? I said, yeah. You're going to meetings every day, right? Yeah. You got a commitment at your meetings? Yeah. You go off for alcohol, with alcoholics afterward and have coffee? Yeah. Uh, are, you, are you being of service? Yeah. Do you call people every day? You call other alcoholics? Yeah. Do you want to do that every single day? Honestly? Yeah, no. Do you ever go to a meeting and do your commitment and you don't even want to be there? Yeah. How do you feel when you leave? Better. How long are you sober now? Six and a half months? What part of the first three steps do you think you haven't done? This isn't theory, sport. You know, this is action. You can't call God and tell Him to deliver you a surrender. You just have to wait and He'll give it to you in his time and the way he's going to give it to you. And it's not your call. Just keep doing what you're doing because you're sober six months. Think about that. You were a pathetic little wimp when I got you. And now you're six months sober. Okay. <laughs> Take me back to work now. <laughs> At least I'm not crying because a seagull went by the car. <laughs> sure enough, in about eight months, I was at the Sunday night Ohio Street meeting. Ed was there. I was mopping the floor. And as they were thanking the speaker, people were lined up, and I'm mopping that floor, not paying any attention to anything, just mopping the floor with these other two losers who were still sober. And uh, I'm look, I stopped for a second, and I looked at the faces of the people in the line to thank the speaker. And I know Cindy was there, and I know Julie was there, and I know, you know that that uh, uh, people I know 
who were still in my group were there. And as my eyes went across their faces, as they were standing in line, it occurred to me in one of those purchase point moments that I knew every single one of them by name. And I liked them. I liked them. It kind of caught me up to where I wouldn't have taken if you had offered to send me any other place where I, than where I was standing right at that moment. I could go any place else in the whole world or be with anybody else. I wouldn't have taken it. I just stood there and thought, whoa, what was that? And I, that was just the beginning of what happens in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm going to have to wrap it up here quickly, but I, I've done all the steps. I'm not going to tell you how to go through the steps because you, here's how you go through the steps. Get a sponsor and ask them, and they'll take you through the steps. Come to Johnny's workshop this afternoon. I think we'll probably have a lot of insight into how to do that. But I'll tell you something. Um, my life began to change. I began to take actions that I didn't believe in and started to become a different person. Not different all the way through, but I managed to go back and make amends to my mother and pay her the money back because of what I heard Sharon B. talk about. And I followed her example and did it. And I developed a relationship with my mom. My mom died uh, three years ago. And the last thing she said to me before I, I was going to leave that afternoon and, and uh, I, said, I got to saying, you know, I, my, my sponsor told me every Thanksgiving to go spend it with my mother and not come to the Pacific Group event because we have this nice Thanksgiving dinner and they have a Clancy dominates over it and, uh, and they have participation by, by ticket, you know, and, and I never had been to that. And Clancy asked me one time, how come you never come to that? And I said, well, my sponsor told me I should spend Thanksgiving with my mom every year. And that's what I do. I go down and have dinner with her. And Clancy said, that's a good, that's a good direction. And um, so I did that. And I developed a relationship with her. And I paid her back the money. And I sent her notes with the checks, just like Sharon did with her dad, and followed her example. And my mom and I developed a relationship. And as I left her that one day when she was sick, um, she hadn't said a word in two days because she had no strength at all. And I said, uh, I love you, Mom. And as I was walking out the door, she said, I love you too. And the nurse in the room turned around and looked at my mother, and she said, she hasn't said a word in two days. She hasn't been able to take liquids. She can't suck liquids up a straw because she doesn't have the strength. I have to feed her liquids with gelatin so that she'll take liquids. And she hasn't said a word. I said, oh, you know, that's pretty cool. And then she died about 12 hours later. And I thought, boy, that's a gift of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because my mom had told me several months before that, she'd always question AA. Like, why do you have to keep going to those, going to those meetings? And how come you ever, every time you come down to see me, you have to go to a meeting afterward? <laughs> but I brought her to our Wednesday night meeting, and, and she met all the people. Every, she met everybody at my Wednesday night meeting. And she started to like AA. And she told me several months before she died, she said, you know what? I think that AA thing is the best thing you ever did. That's coming from my mom, you know. And my father had died before I got sober, and I wasn't able to make amends to him while he was alive. And uh, because my father, I knew, had been terribly disappointed in me. He'd been a drill instructor in the Marine Corps for years. I'm sure the issue of his loins wasn't looking too sharp uh, in his standards. He was a basketball coach and, and baseball coach and all these different coaches in the Marine Corps. And, uh, and um, he, uh, you know, I just guessed that he'd been disappointed in me. I'll tell you a story. I made amends to my father uh, by direction of my sponsor. I was in an Al-Anon conference with Maria one day, and we'd gone down there in separate cars, and I was driving back, and I, I was driving within about a mile of where my father was buried in Cyprus at the forest lawn there, and I'd heard Clint H. talk about his mom a few months before, and I just thought, I've been putting this off for too long. It'd been 10 years. I, my, I'd been 10 years sober when this happened. I, my sponsor told me when I was a year sober to make amends to him, but I never did. And I finally pulled into the forest lawn. I did exactly what Clint said. I went across the street. I got scissors. I got a carnation because my dad loved carnations. I got some Windex, some paper towels, and I went back, and I found his grave, and I cleaned it up a little bit, and I sat down, and I talked to him. I told him about you, and I told him about my life. I told him that I was, I was a different person. I was teaching high school at the time. and I've gone on to a different career from then. I'm actually a right now for a living, but I was just telling him at the time what was happening with me and how I had missed it with him. And I was sorry that I would missed it. And I was sorry that I didn't pay attention to him. And I'm sorry I didn't watch him work in the garage and make things with his hands because he was a great craftsman. And I never paid any attention to it at all. You know? And uh, I was sorry about that, but I was living my life better. 
And I walked out of there, and nothing, nothing changed. The sky didn't open up or anything. I just drove home. And I realized about three months later, I was talking about my father to somebody. I didn't feel guilt anymore. I didn't feel embarrassment. And I didn't feel like he'd been disappointed in me. And what had happened was, and this came out in my inventory, my dad, from the time I was in about the 10th grade till I, or 10 years, 7th grade to the 10th grade, he got up every single morning. As I said, my parents had no resources. And he would make lunch for me. And he would take that lunch and he'd make a sandwich and he'd get my favorite fruit or whatever it was and he'd put it all together and he'd put it in a bag and he'd write my name on the bag with his very, always, I remember his handwriting and he'd set it by the front door. And then he would go off to McDonnell Douglas for the day. He went to that job. He never called in sick at that job. He worked at that job for 25 years and never took a sick day. And uh, I would get up. I'd walk out, grab that bag on my way to school, and as I crossed the property line at school, chunk in the trash can, that bag went. I just kept walking. Every time I did that, I had a little bit of guilt that kind of tightened up, you know. But I never paid any attention to it because it was imperceptible. But I did that every day, every day for years. And so after I made amends to him, I, um, I was feeling kind of emboldened by it. So I sat down with my mom at the kitchen table, and I said, you know... I used to throw my lunch away when Dad would make it. Uh, I threw it away for years. I need to tell you that because I was just an ungrateful kid. And she said, well, I know. I know you threw it away. I said, how did you know I threw it away? And she said, well, your dad told me. We talked about it. And I I said, well, if he knew I was throwing it away, how, how, how come he kept making it for me? How did he know that I was throwing it away, first of all? And she said, well, he'd ask you things like, how was your apple? How was your apple? I'd say, it was great. It was an orange, you know. Was that jelly okay on the peanut butter and jelly? Because I don't know if you liked the, the strawberry jelly. It was perfect, yeah, and it was bologna, you know. And, and he would ask me questions, and he knew I, every day I was throwing it away because every time he asked me, I gave him the wrong answer. And um, I said, well, if he knew I was throwing it away every day, why did he keep giving it? Why did he keep making lunch for me? And my mom looked at me across the table, and she sort of half smiled, and I got it at that point. And it was pure love. It was pure love. He wasn't disappointed in me at all. He adored me. He tried to show it through that. He showed it through a lot of different things. That I was too, you know, just went right past me. Because I had what I wanted. I had a God of my expectations, you know. I didn't have a God of my understanding. And so, if you're new here, that story is just an example of what kind of love you find in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because the nutrition is here. It's served up in awkward ways, but it's always served fresh. It's nutrition for your spirit if you choose to throw it away every day. That's okay. Come back tomorrow. We'll make it for you again until you want to take it. But just because you don't want it doesn't mean we're going to stop making it. You know, that's what we're here for. This is what this fellowship is about. We're not a 12-step program. We're a fellowship of people, of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other so we can stay so. I have two little kids of my own now. I had my son when I was 49 and my daughter when I was 50. And uh, People in AA have taught me how to get through a divorce and how to still be a father, how to be attentive to my children. I, I brush my kids' teeth for them. My daughter asks me after I'm done brushing her teeth to smell my teeth. <laughs> Daddy, smell my teeth. I have to give her the, you know, the, okay, I'll give him the check. They're perfect. I told her on Thursday, I said, I'm going to Chicago tomorrow where there's going to be, it's going to be cold there. And you know what? And she, and Rose looked at me and she said, you're going to miss us. And I said, yeah, you're right, I am. And my son one time, um, has a, he has a tough time sleeping, so I have to lie down with him in his bed, which is a twin bed, which is very interesting. And he's a squirmer, too. So he's got a squirm. He's a squirmer. Uh, and he's, you know, he goes, head, head comes up at the bottom and head comes back up at the top. And laying there, Daniel, we, Daniel, buddy, calm down, go to sleep. But he's got to do that. That's how he goes to sleep. And, and one afternoon he was taking a nap or trying to take a nap. And um, he, got out of, he got out of bed and ran across the room and then came back and got into bed again. And he handed me a toy airplane. And he had one. And he said, put it under your pillow. I said, why? He said, so we can go flying in our dream. I thought, wow. This kid's hooked in. 
you know? So if you're new or you're going through trouble here or you're hurting, stay. We'll go fly in our dreams together. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.